Welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol, Banega Swasth India. We are delighted to introduce Super Infinite, the transformations of John Donne, Catherine Rundle in conversation with Nandini Das. This session is presented by our media partner, Rajasthan Patrika. Sometimes religious outsider and social disaster, sometimes celebrity preacher and establishment darling, John Donne was incapable of being just one thing. In his myriad lives, Donne was a scholar of law, a sea adventurer, a priest, an MP, and perhaps the greatest love poet in the history of the English language. He was a man who suffered from black surges of misery, yet expressed his verse many breathtaking impressions of electric joy and love. In conversation with Nandini Das, Catherine Rundle, the winner of the Bailey Gifford Prize 2022, speaks of her sparkling biography of John Donne, the poet of love, sex, and death. Catherine Rundle is a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. She has written three books for adults, including the Sunday Times bestsellers, Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne, and The Golden Mole, and Other Living Treasures. Her award-winning books for children have been translated into more than 30 languages and sold in the multi-millions. Ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Rundle. Nandini Das, our moderator today, is a professor of early modern English literature and culture and a fellow of Exeter College at Oxford University. She's a scholar of Renaissance literature, travel, migration, and cross-cultural encounters. Courting India, her book on the first English embassy to Mughal India, is forthcoming from Bloomsbury in March 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne, Catherine Rundle in conversation with Nandini Das. Thank you so much. Um, and it's really delightful to be here in the opening session with the writer of a biography that has, despite my years of reading John Donne, really transformed my sense of Donne as a poet and a writer. Catherine, Dunn is a poet of love who is much obsessed with death, a man of faith who kind of seems like a doubter in so many different ways. Can you set the scene for us a little bit? Who was Dunn? What was his England like? Absolutely. Um, I mean, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so Dunn was born, John Dunn, in uh, 1572 at a moment when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. And he was born into a Catholic family at a time when to be Catholic was to be persecuted. So the story goes that John Donne was taken as a small child through the streets of London to see his great uncle hung, drawn, and quartered for the crime of being a Catholic priest. That might be true, but what certainly is true is that when his uncle was arrested for being a Jesuit, he was taken, John Donne, as a little 12-year-old into the Tower of London in order to smuggle another Jesuit into the jail to exchange information. They knew that by taking a child, it would make the moment look sort of easy and familial instead of what it actually was, which was a moment of sort of essentially spying. Um, he lived at a time when he knew a depth of sorrow throughout his life that would be enough to knock people to the ground. He lived through persecution and terror. He, he was, for instance, uh, thrown into jail for marrying a woman, in part because of his Catholic heritage. Well, hold your horses <laughs> on that one, because I really want you to talk about that particular experience. You know, a man gets married and thrown into, gets thrown into jail for, you know, getting married. Um, there is a fantastic story there. But if we roll back to that early little John Donne being led through the streets, so this is a moment in English history which is pretty radical, isn't it? That moment where Christianity has already split into two. So 
England is no longer Catholic in faith. Um, and Dunn is part of this huge population of people who have grown up in certain rituals of the church. They've grown up in a belief in God in a certain way. And all of a sudden, the people on the streets are being told that's wrong. Yes. So it was to be born in a moment where you would know that almost any truth could be overturned. It was something he became obsessed by. The idea of can we be certain about anything when the truths that we were told were eternal religious truths about the nature of God can be shifted every decade or so according to the leader. You know, Henry VIII could abolish yeah. a, a vision of the Catholic Church utterly. Um, Mary, the Queen Mary could bring it back. Elizabeth could abolish it again. A kind of pinballing of religious doctrine through England was enough to leave many people dizzy. It was also a time when it was illegal not to go to church. So the church was not just some side note in one's, in one's lived experience. It was at the heart of it. Um, John Donne's mother, who was a Catholic to the end of her days, was frequently fined for not going to church as she should have. But that's really interesting as well, isn't it? Because it's not simply a matter of faith, is it, in that case? This whole regulation that you must go to church was tied up with where your political loyalties lay. Whether you were a hidden Catholic, which might mean that you were terribly sympathetic secretly with continental Europe, or whether you were a true nationalist Englishman of the period. Exactly that. So if the English crown is the head of the English church, then to keep back your allegiance from the English religious norm was to potentially be an insidious figure in the political landscape. So people were very wary that Catholics would be in some way considering anything from a coup to just a sort of shift towards something more upon European lines. Yeah. And, um, and so you would just be watched with suspicion your entire life. John Donne lived watched. I find that fascinating, this sense of being observed and watched with suspicion, as you put it. Um, this has an effect on him as a young man, as he's growing up, isn't he? And like most of his contemporaries, he goes to Oxford awfully young. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not so like undergraduates <laughs> today. <laughs> right. So John Donne went to Oxford at about 12. And it was partly because he was very brilliant. But you could also go if you weren't. Mm. Um, you would go because at the age of 16, you would have to swear allegiance to the crown. But before that, you could get away with not doing so. So a young John Donne went to Oxford with his little brother Henry in hand. And they would have had quite an extraordinary time. If you read the accounts of Oxford students then, they are very different from the accounts of Oxford students now. People would wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning to start memorizing your Latin. And then maybe sometime around the afternoon, you might uh, write some poetry in the mode of Cicero. And then maybe later, you might uh, change some Greek into English and then back again into some people might have had Hebrew or Arabic. Uh, so there was a kind of doggedness of um, intellectual ruthlessness against one's own tendencies to laziness. But of course, there was also. Um, a lot of sort of wild drunkenness. And we have just never known how much a very young John Donne would have been participating in that. At 12? At 12. You know, it seems Goodness. medium unlikely. I know, yeah. <laughs> but the double translation, this whole idea mm. of learning something by translating it from a different language mm. into another and turning back. Um, earlier today in the opening, we were talking about translation as a theme and its importance. That's pretty foundational for Dunn's thinking, isn't it? The way that words can mean multiple things, the way words unfold. Absolutely that. So I guess the, the question would be, why are we still talking about John Dunn 300 years after his death, 400 years? And of course it is because of the way he wrote. And 
to understand what made him so remarkable, you sort of have to understand what came before. Love poetry in the English language before John Donne arrived had uh, a sense of sort of conformity. And um, so, for instance, you might think of Sir Walter Riley writing poetry for Queen Elizabeth, comparing her to a red rose and then in a different poem, a white rose. And then Sir Philip Sidney uh, comparing a woman's shoulders are unto two white doves. And then in another poem, her cheeks are unto white doves. And there does become a point at which you're like, other birds are available. Um, and far too many doves so anyway. So many doves. <laughs> and, and Dunn, John Dunn erupted out of that tradition and said, it is incredibly unlikely that your desire is like a rose. Human desire is stranger and wilder and more vertiginous than that. And so he, when he became a poet, he chose imagery that would anchor your imagination with its strangeness. So his love poetry has fleas, and um, he compares a woman's tongue to a remora, which was an ancient mythical sucking fish which pulled ships down to the bottom of the ocean. He, um, he imagined uh, uh, compasses, the, like uh, mechanical compasses, twisting one round the other. He, he was constantly thinking of ways to burrow under your skin because he knew that it's not just what you say. The mode you use to say it will embody the nature of the thing. So, so you need to imagine love as something strange. Otherwise, you will start to think of your love as something small. Yeah, I think that's what comes through so wonderfully in your book. Um, that sense of done grasping for a very different kind of a language, that fight with tradition. You know, Philip Sidney, who comes before Dunn, talks in one of his sonnets about the muse saying to him, fool, look in thy heart and write. But then when he looks in his heart, he pretty much spouts Petrarch, <laughs> yeah. the older Italian Renaissance poet. Um, Dunn is really strike, struggling with different ways of thinking about it. Do you think his education has gives him the, the tools to do that? I think so. Dunn had a very idiosyncratic education. As a Catholic, he couldn't go to school, which was probably in some ways a good thing. The public schools of England, places like Eton, which of course now is so famous, were brutal places. Um, the boys were routinely beaten. Uh, they were encouraged to beat each other. Because um, smoking was thought to be good to, for the lungs, they were beaten if they did not smoke. Um, there were accounts of schoolmaster being disciplined for beating boys with a sword so often that it became written in the legislature that you could only beat boys with the side of a sword, not the edge. And it feels like if you had to lay that out, then something has gone slightly haywire in your education system. Um, so there was a kind of coldness that he escaped. So he probably was educated at home uh, by Catholic tutors, then at Oxford, and then he went to the Inns of Court. Oh, and that's a yet another story, isn't it? Yeah. So this is the kind of fairly standard trajectory of yeah. bright young men yeah. in this period. You've spent a few years in Oxford, but then you go where everything is, yeah. in, in other words, to the city, to London, exactly. and particularly to the Inns of Court, where people are training in law, but only nominally in certain cases. Right. A huge number of people who went to the Inns of Court. The Inns of Court is still the place where every barrister in Britain has to pass through. Um, but back then, you would go often, if you were rich, to learn the law to protect your land from lawyers. And so... Don Dunn did not intend to become a lawyer. He went to the Inns of Court in part because it was near the other court, the Royal Court. And it was expected that the young men who went to the Inns of Court would learn to cut some kind of dash, that there would be a kind of rubbing off of charm and elegance uh, that came from the proximity of the other court. And we know that Dunn's childhood had been in some ways complicated and, and cramped by his religion. And as far as we can tell, he kind of 
joyfully erupted onto the scene of London as a young man about town. He became master of the revels, which meant head of making the parties happen. Basically, and the kind of party time person, right, right, wasn't it? Exactly, like you have to be, to be master of the revels, you have to be one of the funnest boys around. Um, and we know that one of the dances that he organized um, was known for the excessive dancing of the galliard. The galliard is a very specific dance which has a lot of um, like little tiny steps and then huge leaps and spins. Queen Elizabeth was said to dance three galliards before breakfast in the morning. <laughs> and that's how she lived such a long life life. And so he had this kind of moment of intellectual abandon. He started writing uh, vivid and arresting poetry. And then uh, what happened was a thing that a lot of people changed his, think changed his life, which was that his little brother, mm -hmm. Henry, the boy who had gone hand in hand with him when he was 12 and Henry was 11 to Oxford, followed him to the inns of court. And Henry was very young. He was 19. And he thought that he could harbor a priest in his rooms in the inns of court. But the inns of court were visited almost every day by cleaners. It was required by law that the cleaners, the cleaning women, had to be under the age of 12 or over the age of 40 because anyone in that bracket might be a temptation and anyone over 40 couldn't possibly be. Um, which I might personally find quite provoking. I, I don't um, know how to, <laughs> what to make of that. <laughs> but um, so, so Henry, with a kind of mad optimism of youth, was found with a priest in his chambers. The priest was taken away and hung, drawn, and quartered. And Henry was the one who betrayed him. Under torture, he said that this man was a priest and did shrive him. And he was thrown into one jail and then moved from that jail into another. And the second jail had plague raging through it. Some people believed, probably wrongly, that he had been moved explicitly because the jail had plague in it as a form of punishment. And all we know is that John Donne did not visit Henry, possibly because of the plague, possibly because he didn't know how little time he had. But Henry caught plague, and within a day, he died alone in the jail at 19. And a lot of people think that that moment, that loss of his little brother, who he was supposed to protect, became part of one of the core changes of his life, which was that John Donne was born a Catholic, but died a Protestant, and one of the most famous Protestants in England. And a lot of people think his blaming of the Jesuits, the Jesuit priest who hid with him, uh, the fact of the Jesuits' extremeness making it very difficult for them to hide anywhere else other than in the bedroom of a 19-year-old boy at some point, he started to shift, and that might have been one of the moments. It's not certain, we'll never know unless new documentation comes to life, but it might have been one of the things that kicked him on the path that would ultimately end with him being the Dean of St. Paul's, one of the most powerful men of the church in Britain. Yeah, I think that's, it's got to change you in some way, and for Don, perhaps, as it comes out so wonderfully in your book, it's also something that pushes him towards the sense of faith as an individual choice yeah. rather than a state-sanctioned steer mm. in some ways. But then, we'll come to that in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the other major change in his life. Tell us about Anne Dunn. So, <laughs> Anne Dunn was 14 when she met him. Her name was Anne Moore. 14 wasn't that startlingly young to meet someone who you would later marry um, in the way it would be today. He was in his early 20s. 
Um, he was working for a man called Sir Thomas Edgerton, keeper of the Great Seal. The Great Seal was the seal of government. No law could be passed without it. And the keeper of the Great Seal kept it in a kind of beaded handbag um, that he had to carry where he went. And Anne was his niece, Anne Moore. And we know almost nothing about her. What we know is what we can gauge from the poetry. And we know that he wrote some of his poetry for her because he puns over and over on her name. And it was for her that some of the greatest love poetry in the English language was written. Um, he wrote uh, one of the poems, for instance, um, Love's Growth, which he probably wrote around the time of their courting. It goes, um, I scarce believe my love to be so pure as I had thought it was, because it doth endure vicissitude and season as the grass. Methinks I lied all winter when I swore my love was infinite, if spring maked it more. And that more was from Anne Moore. That was <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, John Dunn. <laughs> Um, that more was for her, and it means that of the billions of people who have gone on to love John Donne, there is a John Donne industry. You can buy mugs with a, his face on that say, let's get metaphysical underneath. <laughs> but that poem was different for her. For her, it was something that would have cut straight to the center of her heart. And she married him. But she took a huge risk. She was 17 when they married. Women of that period, who I know you have done yeah. so much work on, to take that risk was far greater for her than for him. Mm. Accounts of women who broke free of what the family expected for. He was a ex-Catholic or Catholic, so they married in a Protestant church, by, so by then probably ex-Catholic. Um, his family uh, had lost all their money in the various Catholic confiscations of, of wealth and land. And, and he had this reputation for being a ladies' man, for being a rake, a boy about town, writing these wild, rakish, licentious poetries. And yet she married him. So let's get this straight. Here is this extremely, and we haven't mentioned this, by, by the way, <laughs> extremely good looking right. young man. This is key. He's really hot. And I think that matters. <laughs> like, you must Google him or, or, or buy the book which has pictures. <laughs> but he has this fabulous painting made of him called the Lothian portrait. It's called the Lothian portrait because it was owned by the Duke of Lothian who had it filed under, instead of John Dunn, under Dun, Dun Scotus, which is a completely different person, a 15th century priest who looks as little like John Dunn as it, it is possible to look and still be of the same general species. <laughs> um, he has a hat a lace collar, he cared about presentation, an earring with a cross, a sword, a fabulous tiny moustache that would have taken a lot of work. Um, he writes about clothes, he cares about the performance of clothing, he knows that when you get dressed you ask something of the world, and he is asking people to salute the flair with which he moves. Yeah. So it makes sense that this girl would have come across this boy who was gaining a reputation for being one of the sharpest wits in England and been yeah. carried away. Yes, so, I mean, that's really striking, isn't it? And, you know, if we summarize that, that narrative, here's this extremely good-looking boy whose irreverent wit is already creating a reputation for him, um, and this young girl who essentially falls in love with him a person who works for her uncle, and then are both disgraced. I mean, this is a Bollywood film in the making. <laughs> Isn't it just? I hope so, um, one day. But um, done for done, that love and that sense of desire is transformational. I think so. So I think with done, there are two forms of, of, of poetry about women and about desire. There is the, um, there's the kind of wild rakish poetry, which has in it often a streak of 
of misogyny, uh, the, a streak of sort of uh, sometimes quite disgusted objectification of the female body, sometimes very joyful and saluting, but not coming at the idea of sex with awe. But then there is also um, a kind of mystic religious verse that he creates, whereby he imagines that love might be the place you would go to step outside the confines of everything. Of gender, he says, difference of sex no more we knew than our two guardian angels do. Angels were thought to be without gender. He writes about uh, this mystery did unperplex. The idea that love might be an answer to a question that cannot be articulated but can be felt. He had a sense that to be in love and to love someone might be the way to escape a kind of... He described his mind as a busy and difficult place. He said he had a immoderate hydroptic thirst of learning. He said he had a riddling and labyrinthine soul. He said he had a mind of sullen, weedy lakes where dark thoughts grew. He, he knew what it was to be obsessed with an idea. And often his love poetry is offering the idea of physical love as a moment of stepping outside of that, of somebody who watches the world so fervently, making someone into a world and watching only her. So you have lines like, she all states and all princes I, nothing else is. He, he had a sense of totality of desire, which yeah. I think is one of the reasons that his poetry has endured. This idea of what it is to be or oh, swept with love. I think that's so striking, and you write so wonderfully about that absolute focus on that person of desire. But it's also caught up, again, in his obsession with language. Um, you write wonderfully about his use of the word super, which comes mm. up in your title, Super Infinite, and also un, as in that unperplex. Um, it's, it's a way of reaching beyond language almost, isn't it? Dunn is quite often trying almost to ha arm wrestle language into submission to do what he wants. Exactly that. <laughs> For John Dunn, language is not a set of rules that you obey. It is a set of possibilities. And he had a sense that in order, there are bits of every human heart that absolutely can be met with the easiest of human language, with the bits that are rhyming love and dove. But there are also bits that are so riddlingly original that you will have to shake language into the specific shape of your own imagination in order to write something true. And therefore, he broke all the rules of poetry and a lot of people got very cross about it. So Ben Jonson, another of the great poets of the age and a more famous writer than Dunn, said, Dunn for not keeping of accent deserved hanging. Um, but let's face it, I mean, Johnson didn't like anyone who wrote better than him. <laughs> right, Johnson, uh, famous, one of the reasons we have a lot of great gossip from Johnson, because a man called William of Hawthornden wrote it down. But it's just this fabulous litany of Johnson bitching about people who are better than he is, <laughs> often while very drunk. Um, so I'm very grateful to William of Hawthornden for just, you know, making notes of that. Um, Dunn loved the super prefix. He wrote about the idea that after death there would be not infinite but super infinite heavens. He wrote super miraculous, super eternal, super dying. Words that we would not think need an intensifier were intensified by Dunn. And I think, as you say, often one of the things he is trying to do with this idea of super infinite, he is often trying to push language to its furthest point and then wait for language to point beyond itself. And in the space beyond language, that is where you find what it is you're looking for, whether that is love or whether that is God. For Dunn, God is not something that can be expressed. It is only something that can be 
gestured towards outside of what we can know. Yeah. I mean, when you were talking about Dan and also, you know, earlier, Ab Abdul Raza Gurna was talking about resistance and what writers resist. For Dan, that resistance is to limitations of language. But, you know, in, that, in his inaugural ad address, Gurna also talked about writers resisting constraints of the everyday. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about money. Dan and money. What was going on with him? So. The great romantic moment of his life, the moment where they crept out of the house to get married in the cold of winter, Dunn did not realize how badly it would go. He knew that uh, Anne Moore's mother, Sir George Moore, would not be thrilled because she could have made a great marriage. She was said to be very beautiful. Um, and instead of being grudgingly accepted, which is probably what he expected to happen, he was immediately thrown in jail. And he was thrown into the Fleet Prison, which was the debtor's prison. So it didn't even have any glamour to it. It was said to be carpeted with lice, so that if you walked, you could hear a crunch under your foot. And eventually he was released and was allowed to take his bride. And it was declared legal and there was nothing George Moore could do about it. But he was fired, and they had no money, and they had to go and live with Anne's little cousin, a sort of 19-year-old gambling addict with a nice big house <laughs> who was very into, like, horses and dogs and not books. And, and then they just spent the next years trying to pull their way back into middle-class prosperity and failing and failing again. And this was where the dark years came. And of course, while Dunn is writing terribly flattering and over-the-top letters to his various patrons, asking for jobs, asking for money, basically asking, Anne is producing babies. Yes. Because that's what the woman's role was. Exactly. How many children they, did they have again? She was pregnant 12 times. Two were stillborn. Yeah. And then they lost another four. It's something of a terrible and typical Dunyan ir irony, isn't it? That the point where he reaches success, when he finally is financially stable and safe, is the point where he loses Anne. Exactly this. So Anne was pregnant or recovering from pregnancy her entire adult life. And it was finally a baby that killed her. And it was around the time that he was starting to turn towards becoming a priest. Uh, her, her 12th labor was too long and she died. And then he continued losing children. And it became a, a great sorrow to him and his letters become peppered with a desire to die himself. Almost every letter has some, sometimes a light-hearted joke about wanting to die and sometimes a very vivid iteration of it. Dunn wrote the first full-length treatise on suicide in the English language. He was someone who, who was bedecked by grief his entire life. And this is what I think makes him remarkable. He knew sorrow that very few men might know because, of course, it was fairly common to lose children, but so many children. And to constantly, as he says, feel the pull of mine own sword upon my hand. And yet, Dunn insists, like almost no other writer of the period, on awe, on the idea of astonishment at what it is to be alive. He says, to compare a man unto the world is too little a thing. Compared unto a man, the world itself is a dwarf. Next to God, there is no larger thing. He thought of us as colossal and eternal. He insisted from the pulpit, this was very unusual, on laughter. He said, those who fail to laugh, that is a stupidity, that is a contempt. He had this sense of us as both utterly faulted and, and bleak and wounded and also a miracle, like the great broken shining miracle of the world. 
And to read his poetry and then his prose is to hear him insisting, it is an astonishment to be alive and therefore behoves you to put in the work, the, the moral willpower, the strain that it would take to be astonished. And so I find that remarkable. It, it is remarkable, isn't it? And even as you're kind of quoting and paraphrasing bits of it, I can quite imagine why thousands of people, crowds perhaps like this, would gather to hear his sermons at St. Paul's. Because exactly. by this stage, he's at St. Paul's, right? He is. So, yeah. so Dunn, uh, uh, in his 40s, finally makes a decision and turns to become a priest. There are many debates about whether he did that because he couldn't find another job or whether he did it because he truly longed for God. I think myself it is probably closer to the latter, but there is a range of opinions, so you can hold anyone you like and people will agree with you. And then he became a priest, and he became, slowly, the most famous priest in England. 6,000 people once crowded to see him speak at St. Paul's Cathedral in the heart of London, in England. And, and there was one account of when he was going to consecrate a chapel at Lincoln's Inn. And whenever anyone heard that he was preaching, crowds would flock to hear him. It's important to remember that sermons back then, there wasn't that much else to do. So they were one of the main forms of entertainment. Yes, they were often serious religious expositions, but they could also have news from Europe. They could have religious propaganda. Sometimes they could be vivid and enticing. There were also, sometimes they were very, very long. Duns were usually about an hour, but they could go up to three hours. There was an account of a parishioner, not his parishioner, um, in, in another county at the same time, petitioning the king to remove their priest because he spoke for so long that they would milk the cows, go to church, and then by the time they got back, it would be too late for the second milking. It was an entire day <laughs> of sermonizing. So Dunn stepped into this arena, and at one of these sermons, so many thousands of people flocked to hear him talk that there was a great crush and one of the contemporary um, writings says that two or three people were taken up dead for the time. So it doesn't mean dead, it just means unconscious, like trampled underfoot. So basically and, yeah. there's a mob, There's a mob, there's a stampede to hear John Donne. John Donne superstar. Right, exactly, like this, <laughs> this, kind of, this kind of celebrity moment. And we think that if he had stopped, the contemporary report would have recorded that. So as far as we know, he just kept going as these men were carried away to be treated medically. The show and must go on. The show must go on, <laughs> a kind of ruthlessness that he has always had. So here is John Donne, you know, delivering these wonderful sermons, parts of which have like flotsam and jetsam come into our speech every time we talk about no man being an island, we are quoting Dunn, whether we know or don't. But at the same time, this is Dunn, the father of multiple children, worrying about whether he's got enough dowry to marry his daughter off. So this is the thing. I love Dunn. I, I find his poetry electric. I think that if people read Dunn's poetry, it takes effort, he's famously one of the most difficult poets, but it will shift something within you. But there is no escaping that the fact that he could also be like a real horror escape. Like he, he was not a good father. His daughter Constance got married to Edward Allen, one of the most famous actors of the day, uh, one of the most glamorous men, keeper of the bears for the king. And he promised her a diamond ring. He took a diamond ring from her and he said, I'll swap it for a better one. Um, and this is important because women could not own property, but they could own jewelry. So he, she couldn't own land. The only thing that would actually be hers was her jewels. And he said he would take her ring and give her his better ring. And then he just kept both. <laughs> And then there was a moment where he promised her a little pony that um, she wanted to ride, and he promised it to her, and then he sent it to his son in Oxford. And then he promised he would lend her husband some money, and then 
He didn't. And then he promised his son-in-law that he could come to the house to stay. And we know that he didn't because one of the letters to him from Edward Allen says, essentially, to paraphrase, you have been using language in your letters to me that do not befit a priest and make you sound like the kind of tear-around boy you were when you were 17. <laughs> um, he, he, he was in no way perfect, this man. He had these great chasms of blind spots, of furies, of, of lacks of generosity. So when we think about Dunn, we have to think about someone with these staggering flashes of genius, but also great sweeps of things you would not want to emulate. But as a biographer, that's important to acknowledge as well, isn't it? That's what makes Dunn such an interesting figure to dissect, and he would have loved that idea of dissection because it keeps cropping up in his own writing. The sense that a beautiful body has flesh and muscles and icky stuff underneath. <laughs> and that icky stuff is equally as fascinating, as important. That's, what, that's the foundation on which the beauty is created yeah. in some ways. Exactly that. This idea that he, so he was fascinated by, by the nature of the body, you know. It was at a moment where you could go publicly to see corpses dissected sometimes if you had access to the university. And we have no evidence he went, but his knowledge of human anatomy suggests that it's possible. Um, he had this sense of the body as something to be explored. And that is a mixture there are moments where that exploration is, is vividly alive with wonder and with love. He describes a woman's body as like, oh my America, my newfound land. This idea of stepping into someone else's body as stepping into a new world. But then he does also have these moments where he like, he is, uh, playing with a tradition where you insult someone else's mistress and he he writes about like the ripe spermatic boils on her body he <laughs> and it was normal to insult your mistress it wasn't normal to go quite that far he <laughs> compares her to like the sweat that you would make from a broth if you were boiling a shoe in a moment of plague like he really goes for it <laughs> and he holds both of these things at once he was a man who held so many things in one hand. A desire for death and a vivid desire to live. A passion for love and a knowledge of dread. A sense of wonder and a sense of abject failure. He lived these great extremes and managed to charter a path through them that meant that his work shines with the power of that doubleness. And Above all, I think what comes through in your writing um, about Dunn is his sense of the duty, the writer's duty, to speak the truth. There's that wonderful third satire, which you will remember, the moment where he's talking about truth. Um, and for an Indian audience particularly, the sense of a pilgrimage come, would come through very strongly. He talks about truth as, you know, as on a huge hill, cragged and steep, truth stands, and he that will win her, about her, ab and about it must go, and what the hill's suddenness resists, wins so. So that sense of reaching for a truth, how important, as a final perhaps observation, can you tell us a little bit about how important that is for Dunn? He was so honest. He believed in such honesty and such honesty about the questing for truth. His whole adult life was this searching, often in prayer. And then in his sermons, he will offer a sense of how difficult it is. So many sermonizers of the time laid themselves out as a model, as what you should do. But Dunn says in one of his sermons, he can't control his mind at prayer. He should be the perfect prayer, but he's not. He says, I summon God and his angels, and then when they are in the room, I ignore them for, he says, the sound of a fly, a straw under my knee, a something, a chimera, a nothing. This sense that we are always trying and always falling short. 
But the thing he did offer us in the most famous work that he wrote, I guess, the one that everyone knows, which is one of his devotions upon emergent occasions, where he writes that famous quote, no man is an island. He is writing about the idea that we are so profoundly interconnected that it is only from each other that we gain our meaning. He writes, every man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. The sense that there is the great duty is to keep looking at one another and seeing the intricacy of the human heart and not to step back from the reality of it. And that that's insistence. What he, that, that's wonderful, isn't it? And that's what he does so, um, so obsessively, that unflinching look at both himself and others and still be fascinated, still be interested, super interested if, even. Um, Catherine, your biography of Dunn is luminous and wonderful and what comes through it above all is that kind of fascination with Dunn's language, his ability to wrestle with language, question it and still love what language can do to each other and to ourselves um, above everything else. Thank you so much. Catherine Rundle, everyone. We would like to thank Catherine, Catherine Rundle and Nandini Dask for their super interesting conversation. But one could also say their conversation about John is done. <laughs> we thank Rajasthan Patrika for their support. And Catherine will also be signing her books at the author signing stall right here on the right of the stage. So you could, if you have any questions, please catch her here. And you know, the conversation is then undone. Um, Please help us in keeping the festival venues clean and dispose of your waste in all the waste bins placed across the hotel. And in case you do see an unattended blue shawl, uh, please, if you could return that to the green room on our right, uh, that we would be eternally grateful for that. We thank both our author and moderator for this session. A huge round of applause for them. And we await you at the next session at the front lawn of Jeff Literature Festival 2023. Namaskar, I am an AI avatar.